Well, back in November, we had the first evening on mobilizing Exeter's community enterprising spirits, and that was all about food, locally grown food and access to healthy food for all uh, Exeter residents. And I thought I'd just, some of you might have not been there. Um, so I thought I'd just give you a little bit of context on this series um, and how it, how it originated. So as a response to the first lockdown, gosh, that was April, I think, um, Colab Exeter, which is the wellbeing hub on King William Street, uh, just behind John Lewis, um, Exeter Community Initiatives, a charity that helps uh, people and that are facing inequality, homelessness, and um, is also housed in Colab, and Essence, Exeter Social Enterprise Network. They came together um, to join forces in understanding how we can support the communities during and beyond the health crisis that we're currently in, with also the awareness of the limitations of our current economic model and the climate crisis. Um, I'll just share my screen because it just helps. So these conversations uh, between Colab, ECI and Essence resulted in a shared vision for mobilizing Exeter's community enterprising spirit um, and can be summarized as follows. Mm -hmm. So the key to mobilizing Exeter's community ent enterprising spirit is not just in how communities are supported financially, it is more importantly about how they can be helped to connect and collaborate in order to meet the communal needs of a place. Through this, we achieve a joined up approach that builds back better by solving what are often related social, economic and ecological issues and challenges. Um, we are grateful uh, to Barrow Cat Connect Fund, who is funding this project and this event series um, via Simple. And that's the logo that you also see at the bottom of the page here. Um, the Simple project is all about how we can better use social investment. Um, and that's woven into um, to the approach to how we see the, the social and economic fabric of Exeter strengthening. So if we are serious about supporting community groups to continue to deliver food and medication and other welfare and enterprising activities, um, then we would like to propose a few things. First of all, we should entertain the notion that about what is the definition about community, that community is not merely a consumer of services, but that they can be a leader and innovator, a wealth builder and a valuable contributor, an important co-designer in policy decisions in a new economy. And we borrowed that um, definition from uh, CLESS, the Center of Local Economic uh, Systems. Secondly, we would like to um, uh, um, propose that we embrace community enterprise as a vehicle for community groups to continue, if they have that aspiration, the good that they are doing. And what do we mean with community enterprise? Community enterprise is a social enterprise that trades within a geographical area with a defined interest group, and sometimes both. And for those less familiar with community and uh, with social enterprise, simply put, social enterprise is a business that trades to tackle the social problems, um, improve communities, people's life chances, and or the environment. In our eyes, it also takes a continued commitment to dialogue and joint action with all sorts of organizations across Exeter and beyond to truly establish a more joined up approach between the various organizations within the voluntary community, um, social enterprise and charity sector in, in Exeter. Right. Um, let me see. Somehow this seems blocked. Oh, uh, there we are. Great. So tonight we've got a great lineup of contributors who are going to share their ideas, experience and learning um, when they are reclaiming indoor and outdoor spaces as a community asset. The theme of reclaiming indoor and outdoor spaces as a community asset came about through various conversations with Exeter social entrepreneurs, um, community organizations, and also built upon the national conversations during the Ethical Consumer Week and more local conversations, um, such as the Cocars uh, Coffee Club on building a community high street. The contributions of Olya, 
Lynn and Jojo, um, who will introduce shortly, have a common thread. They are all about empowering communities to restore their neighborhoods socially, ecologically, and economically. Socially, we see that the tighter communities are, it will be an antidote to the widespread social isolation and fragmentation that is currently taking place. Economically, we will uh, see that when we have more local ownership and entrepreneurial activity, that more jobs get created and available skills, expertise and wealth in the area gets recycled, so to speak. And lastly, ecologically, with better social connections and economic resilience, um, the ability to take care of our natural spaces increases. What would Exeter look like and feel like and smell like um, if we reimagine our streets into more than just places to leave our cars and hurry from one building to the next? And if we concentrate on repurposing indoor and outdoor spaces towards more community benefit um, uh, and when that's put central. So I will let our contributors, Olya, Jojo and Lynn and Paul speak more, much more eloquently and in depth uh, with practical examples. Um, and I will just pass over to you now, Nick, to lead. Uh, Thank you very much indeed. Um, the, 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 the main, yeah, thank you, uh, Daphne. The, the main segment of the uh, of, of tonight is going to be uh, three, I'm calling them demos in my head, presentations, little conversations, uh, by uh, for some some really interesting different projects. Um, how it's going to work is that um, each project I've given them a challenge of being able to explain their idea in five minutes, no more, and then after that there'll be five minutes of of uh, questions. I've got a few questions, but I hope you'll have lots of questions, and I'd like to prioritise any questions you have, and then we'll have a little Q and A. You can either throw your question in the chat, and me and Daphne will sort of pick it up there. Or if you want to raise your hand, we'll just let you ask the question directly if you'd like to do that way. So whatever you'd like to do is, is fine by us. So uh, so each one will have five minutes, then we five minutes Q&A, we'll go on to, to the next one. Um, and what I'll do is I'll introduce each one in turn. Uh, once we've had three demos, we're going to have a little uh, interview chat with Paul, who's going to give us a, a nice wider context of uh, social enterprise in the community through some of the data and research he's done uh, to give us sort of some nice sort of con context at the end of it. Okay, um, if that's okay, I'd, I'd like to first, I'm um, happy or very keen to introduce uh, Lynn Wettenhall, and she's, uh, I'm sure many of you know her already, uh, but she, one, of her, one of her projects is uh, Food Exeter, and uh, she's going to talk to us about an Exeter market. Hi, Lynn. Yep, I'm a trustee of Food Exeter, which is a still a relatively new charity set up to achieve long term strategic change on all aspects of food in the city. You seeing Food Exeter, a charity working for sustainable? Yes. Yep, yes, fantastic. Yeah. OK, off we go. So that's us. Uh, this is a pitch for why I want to try and persuade you that Exeter desperately needs a modern marketplace and other markets. And I'm going to just talk about what that means, Oh, except that the... Uh, the slide, there we are. So a modern marketplace for Exeter, that is in fact Preston, which has built a lot of its regeneration about a, around a revitalized market. What do we mean when we say modern marketplace, modern marketplace? For, for us in Food Exeter, it means something that is absolutely multifunctional. So start to think about a space that hosts businesses, social enterprises, but on some days it might host local organizations, charities, community groups, and essentially it has space to probably eat and drink. And you know, this is the ideal. The other thing about a modern marketplace is that it is, again, the ideal. There's indoor space and outdoor space. So the outdoor space can become performance space and things like that. The very mundane but critical power and water that it's designed, a modern marketplace is designed to be a marketplace. There's power and water in the right places and there is designed access and parking for storeholders. And anyone who's talked to anyone who runs, uh, you know, has stalls at the farmer's market, they will tell you it is a living nightmare, the farmer's market, because it doesn't have 
any of those things. And the, the stalls have to be put up and down and the parking and the unloading. All of these things make up what we're calling a modern marketplace. Why do we think it's so important? Well, I haven't, I'm not going to dive into the detail, but believe me, there is enormous evidence from the UK and elsewhere that a modern market, as opposed to the old fashioned crumbly ones, which interestingly are doing very badly, the old school markets that haven't changed, that still have people selling tat are doing badly. But modern markets that are the kind of thing I've just talked about are doing really well. They, they form a basis for wider recovery critically and, the retailers in Exeter don't believe this and a lot of councillors don't believe it but it does bring this absolutely abundant evidence that it brings additional footfall to the existing shop so the retailers don't lose out they gain it's the absolute you know we see it as a key way to stimulate and support smaller and innovative producers when we interviewed the farmers market stallholders about three years ago virtually all of them said it was the single most important thing that helped them as a small sustainable food producer and of course it supports the local economy and we can all throw out phrases like community wealth donut economics circular economy all those good things come from that so um, I also want to just quickly plug the idea of neighbourhood mini markets as well. Um, what we mean is a, a market that is held in private space, like a community centre. The one on the left is Scotland. The one on the right is an amazing, somewhat ramshackle, but fabulous new tiny community market held out at the top of Stoke Hill at Goffinland. And you can see how basic it is, you know, but it's really quite popular. And it is providing a, an essential opportunity for micro producers. So we, we're really keen on neighbourhood mini markets. And we actually had two ready to rock and roll in Newcourt and in uh, Polslow when COVID hit in, in last year. Yes, last year. So we, we also just want to plug that. But I'm mainly focusing on the, the central market. Why is now such a really great time for a modern marketplace in Exeter, a really bold move to say, this is what we need. Well, there is at least one very promising site, which is, if you, you all recognise that, that's the old bus station. But all, if you look at the top left quadrant of that picture, most of that land, the old Banfield Street car park and all the Sidwell Street shops and all the Paris Street shops, that is council-owned land. The well, council one more minute. Then. One more minute. Yeah. OK, so we think that that is all those things, COVID, all those things are going to absolutely are reasons to have a market more than ever. And we've got another idea. We think there should be a permanent modern marketplace and that should be something that's called for and supported. But in the meantime, when they finish doing the leisure centre and the bus station, there's going to be an empty Banfield Street, street car park. And we think, could we have some kind of pop up? medium term market with a little eco canopy experiment with it could it be run by community enterprise exciting ideas so this is our call out what do you think of these ideas who else is interested we would love to see a campaign for a marketplace next to that's why i'm doing this tonight can we start a campaign for a modern marketplace are there other ideas have we missed something out what does it make you think what i've talked about and i'm inviting you to talk about that in a breakout group later and that's the that's our information thank you very much that was that was perfect to the second lynn that was very <laughs> impressive i like it very good um perhaps uh does anyone have any questions i wonder if you could stop sharing lynn that would be really yeah. helpful thank you yeah do any, are there any questions they'd like to put in the chat or if they'd like to just kind of raise their hand or uh, uh, or does, does anyone have a comment? And um, Paul? I just um, wondered, Lynn, I mean, in the institutions that look after Exeter, so Exeter City Council, is there any support at all in there for the idea and the concept or does it... That there's active there's active, there's active resistance from the City Council. We have it in okay. writing. Uh, bid business what, what's it called in exeter the business improvement district there is some interest they certainly would like to see they had a bit of an idea of taking over one of the really big empty stores like bhs and turning it into an indoor market but we've not come up an exeter green party i know it's part of their long-standing policy but we're not aware of anyone else no. i think part of it is it's a vision thing if you've never seen a modern marketplace and how inspiring it can be you don't even consider it so yeah 
So, Lynn, um, what what do you think the catchment or the um, the sort of circle? If you have it, have something in the centre of Exeter, how far out do you think people will want to come into the market, or do you think it's even beyond outside Exeter? It's a really good question, and it's really fascinating. There are more and more thriving mini farmers markets around. So I think in one way that the sustainable answer is not that far. The sustainable answer is it would be for mainly for Exeter. But obviously you hope it would uh, draw in other people. But, you know, the Teen Valley has got a new newish farmers market. It is so popular. It's just in an old field near near Cristo. It's re- and, and, you know, it's really exciting because, honestly, every single person in that farmer's market lives within about a mile or two of the market, of, of where the market's held. I was really impressed. So those things are popping up. And we know that sustainable food producers are increasingly relying on these small markets. Cool. I've got a couple of questions. Actually, there's one. Oh, one. I just I see some raise their hand, but there's a couple in the chat. I just want to pick those up. Um, there's one from Polly, Polly Frost. She said, is there anything in Biddeford or... Um, in bid for Biddeford or bid for Barnstable? I, I don't is. know what that is, Polly. Polly, do you um, want to read yourself and explain? Yeah, hi, um, hi. I'm Polly. Um, I I don't know, Lynn, there's, they're too big um, uh, sort of high street re- regeneration projects, one in Biddeford and one in Barnstable. I'll dig some info out and send it over. That's okay, I can okay. look online probably. Yeah, yeah that's Chris useful. Fuller in Torridge is... Um, on it with the Biddeford one. Okay, thanks. Okay. That's really useful. And um, uh, Stuart, did you want to ask something? Uh, yeah. Um, so, Lynn, are you aware? Are there any existing plans for that Banfield? Yes. Space? Good question. Very good question. This, this is sorry that I, I'd rush that slide a bit. The, the, the city council have a plan that is now probably at least a year and a half, two years old, which is that the whole of that upper quadrant I refer to, which is really surprisingly big, guess what? It's going to be luxury homes, boutique hotels, high street chains. It's a 1980s vision, I'm afraid. Mm. And, so, and so, so yeah, so and what we're saying, what we think is that's never going to happen. It's just never going to happen. That They're relying on massive internal investment to transform that quadrant. And we're saying, let's do it in a bottom-up, homegrown way. Um, yeah. So, so um, Crown Estates actually own the yeah. kind of corner, the Paris Street, Sidwell Street corner, yeah. don't they? So they've got uh, their own the, plans for that. But I think the council own it all i think crown estates have the lease no could you crown estate okay. well the count the council own a really I, i'm absolutely certain of my facts on this they own a really significant chunk of land and it's incredibly unusual for a council to fully and freely own a massive chunk of city center real estate and that's why it's such a significant community resource mm, good thanks I, very much Stuart. that's really appreciated is there any other any other questions uh, i noticed uh, jane comment Sorry? Yeah. I see Fiona. Oh, Fiona, great, yeah. cool. I uh, just, it, it, that, it, well, I mean, it sounds lovely. I and mean, the Goffin Farm is, is lovely as well. It's a great site. I'm just, I'm curious because I think, although the council, you know, as you say, it's a year and a half, they've been talking about these plans. A lot has changed in a year and a half. And, you know, I think perhaps, I don't know. I, I'm curious about how we can build momentum behind the conversation in a really positive way, rather than the kind of um, bashing the council and, and kind of which you know we're all kind of we all want to do sometimes. I understand that, but also I think is how do we build a kind of momentum of conversation? So, so for example, how do we get the, the if you like the, the kind of the the big hitters like John Lewis, say for example, behind a vision. So because that's where people like the council will listen to an extent. So, for example, John Lewis, I know during um, Christmas period, had their own market, didn't they? So they, they talked to local residents and, and, and all businesses rather and said, you know, this is not about being in competition. This is about recognising that, you know, this, the smaller shops in Fourth Street and Gandhi Street and things bring people to the city centre, which, of course, then benefits John Lewis. So John Lewis said, right, let's have a marketplace in John Lewis to celebrate the work of, of these of the people in the city. So I think you, you've almost got an open door there with some of the bigger organisations to say, actually, we do need a different high street. We do need a different way of looking yeah, at things. And I, I think, I, yeah. simple as it is, I think that's where you you then get people like the council starting to listen. 
Oh, that's really I, I, I agree, yeah. but building an alliance that the council will listen to is quite hard work and we can't do it on our own. So that's okay. why we're really calling out saying who else wants, you know, is there interest in starting a, a positive lobbying in, on this, really? Our next demo, which is um, by Olia Petrakova from Nate Tank. Um, hi, Olia, how are you? Um, hello, I'm, I'm Olia. I am a, a lecturer at the University of Exeter on MA Creativity, Innovation and Business Strategy, as well as um, I'm co-artistic, well, I'm artistic director, sorry, of, of uh, Make Tank and uh, co-artistic director of a theater company. Um, and uh, the last one, the last responsibility has been thwarted seriously by uh, lecturing and running Make Tank. And so in a way we are trying to reposition how we run it. So there's more space for actual practice, social practice. Um, so yeah, that's what I do. Lovely, thank I'm you. Much as busy uh, with business. Yeah, great. And as soon as you've, soon, once you've uh, set up your, uh, your presentation, we'll get you going. Great, here we go. There it is, and present. Okay, and you've got five minutes. Great. So um, quickly about Make Tank. So we um, found this derelict space in the city centre. We are all talking about the same streets at the moment. This is Paris Street um, that Stuart just mentioned. Um, this was a sofa workshop and then it was some other um, uh, enterprise and then it was abandoned. Um, so we moved in there in 2019. Um, this is Make Tank uh, now, today, um, as we were celebrating um, this 2020 season, holiday season. Um, this is when it gets pretty busy, when it was busy with activities um, in 2019. Sorry, that's my, that's my uh, puppy. Um, so our story is we um, inhabited this five Paris street um, on the 1st of February, 2019. Then we expanded and added five studios, a form of um, sweat and stretch um, a space above um, our uh, sofa shop. And uh, we added a working space and atelier. And of course, um, shortly after our first um, birthday, we went into lockdown. And then here we are today. Um, we are responding to now and shaping the future with all of you, hopefully. Um, there is a lot of activities. I'm not going to go into them, but there's a lot of things that we managed to do at the time when the space was open. And we managed to do quite a few things actually when the space was closed as well. One of them is actually, we hosted an artist um, in our space, uh, Brendan Berry, and the latest update, um, we, Brendan got the keys to the space on Sidwell. So there will be another uh, space similar to our galleries and to Make Tank. Um, uh, it's going to be Positive Light. That's a photography space, um, social practice driven um, enterprise. Um, right next to, well, a couple doors down from um, Sidwell's Bakery. So I think there's something happening on, on Sidwell Street and we want to continue that momentum. So this is just a photo of some of the activities. This is wonderful circle tales that not only um, did they activate uh, the space with their um, wonderful game and um, made us all participate in um, uh, practicing our imagination, but they also, as you can see in the background, they've transformed uh, the windows. Um, and that all kind of feeds into what we're about to do. So Make Tank is really a common ground for co-creation. We do everything together and it's a place where we want to challenge the status quo through play, experimentation, exploration, and we really want to ignite change in the city because we want to live in a creative city with arts and culture at the helm to create the social change that city needs. I don't know how many of you know, but besides the fact that Exeter is a um, city of literature, it's actually a part of UNESCO's Creative Cities Network, 246 members. And there is a lot to learn from other creative cities. And um, we would love to figure out how to make Exeter a much more vibrant, colorful, creative, artistic, um, destination, and actually more than anything before destination, a place for all of us to live in. 
So Megtang is a cultural lab. That's how we position ourselves. And um, I'm going to skip this. So our mission is to nurture and support artists and creative makers and to advocate for their place in society as essential workers with a real world value. We see artists are more than um, normally um, uh, perceived. Artists working can work with local governments and businesses and they can help address a whole set of needs and opportunities. Um, so there's a lot that artists can and should do. Um, and we can communicate a unique identity and sense of place, improve public safety, traffic, um, calming, wayfinding, pedestrian transit experiences. We can activate and beautify physical spaces like vacant lots and storefronts and fences. We can do a lot. The list is long, but the list is actually still very limited because with our imagination, we can probably expand it. And so what we are doing right now is we are inviting you to join in reimagining city center. Um, we have a name that we came up with, but also what we, um, as Make Tank, we're holding back to release that until actually the conversation starts and the name is actually identified by the stakeholders of this initiative. So reimagining city center is sort of the driving, the driving theme, but that is not the name of this initiative. So, this initiative is based on the fact that we see city center as a living laboratory that fosters creative and collaborative energy in innovation, design, education, and arts. And actually those four words stands for, for idea. So Make Tank is really should be a common space for ideas. And so what we imagine is through arts and design practices, we are seeing a diverse group of residents, artists, local authorities, Exeter City Council, organizations will engage in urban planning and redevelopment that is connective, creative, and sustainable. Um, and that will be done through agile environment in three stages. First is a common space to come and have a conversation, which is something we'll attempt to do today in 20 minutes of our breakout room session. And then from there, we will go into the playground where we will test and try some ideas and that will be in different, in different uh, time and place. And the hothouse is actually of actually trying putting those ideas forward onto the ground, uh, whether it is a space that is being transformed or a public space that is being utilized. Um, so, so there's a, a set, that's okay. I'll go through this really, really fast. So there is a number of uh, ways to do it. One is lighter, quicker, cheaper. And I'm just gonna go through the pictures now because this is uh, Sidwell Street now. And these are the inspirations that I've been gathering about what streets can be. Uh, lighter, quicker, chip away. <laughs> and how we can play with empty spaces in a different environment. That's it. <laughs> Great. I'll leave it on that. Olya, thank you so Here much. That's brilliant. Really exciting. Very exciting. So um, perhaps if you, perfect. Um, so. Uh, any questions for uh, Olya? I'm just looking around the audience to see if there's anyone got to like to ask something now. Okay. Um, so uh, Olya, while, while people are thinking about their questions, so what's your kind of long-term aim then? Do you have a sort of three or five year aim in terms of the change you want to make within Exeter? I think it's a 20 year aim. Oh, okay. Uh, well, wow. Yeah. <laughs> I think we have a um, livable board. Apparently they're working on their vision 2040. And if you're looking at their vision, you will see that arts and culture is on the second page in like one sentence. And that's a very sad future if that's the 2040 where arts and culture is standing. I think most progressive cities in today's world are actually understanding that arts and culture has to come to the forefront. And so um, I think that um, this, this particular project is, a, is starting to understand what we have now and going through a common exploration of the challenges we're facing in the city center, something that Lynn eloquently portrayed um, that we have. And I think there is a wider advocacy that can happen uh, in a cultural way, because I see food, for instance, um, UNESCO cities, one of the strands is gastronomy. So mm -hmm. it is very much about culture. So I'm very excited about Lynn's project and I would run to her room right now. Um, so I think we can come together and think about these things, especially, you know, city centers, what where Make Tank is and where we're interested in engaging community to really unpack where we're heading with it. Sure. 
Any other questions? Just looking around. I've, I've got other ones. I've just, I was just wondering, what do you think? Because you mentioned, obviously, there are challenges for artists. And I was just thinking, you as an organisation, what's your biggest challenge at the moment? Did you hear? Yeah, sorry. Well, you know, we all right now just, That's cool, we are in, in a very, very, <laughs> very sad place where we have yeah. spaces, but we, we, we can't congregate. We can't share. Um, we, the challenge is how do we mobilize and, and maintain a momentum? And that's the challenge. And I think mm. we start with gathering on Zoom. That's... Mm. Cool. So how, how are you engaging with different groups within Exeter? Because obviously there's, lo there's lots of different communities within the community of Exeter. How are you kind of getting some are more easy to access than others. And I'm just kind of curious at how you, you know, you're looking into that. Um, starting locally, super locally. So starting with neighborhood in which I reside is one first place. Um, going to the well-being Exeter and speaking with community builders. Another one, there is a number of forums, artist forums, EVAF, which is as Stuart is running. It's a visual arts forum. There is um, Emma Welton is here. She runs music and sound forum. Um, we are uh, putting together performance in Exeter network as well. So that's another initiative that we're um, initiating. Um, Essence, it's through the networks and, and yeah, different, different um, activators in the city. Very of good. course, uh, why am I, Fiona is here, Olab. Yeah, there is a number of important stakeholders here. Sure. Oh, I see seeing somebody <laughs> so waving. Did you want to did you want to say something, Fiona? I was gonna say actually, unfortunately I have to go in a moment, but I was just there's um I wanted to give a little, little snapshot really quickly of an example where we have during the, the sort of uh, Christmas period and a few weeks before we had the giving hub in the center of Pinterest A. And it's a really good example of how a unit in the middle of Princess Hay in a very kind of, you know, traditional kind of shopping centre can be done very differently. And we've had some extraordinary feedback about it. And we're looking at how we can expand and develop that as well um, into, a, you know, a, a gallery and all sorts of things. But it's all based around people with lived experience of homelessness in this context. Um, so I think that there's, there's lots of willingness out there. And I think there's a real momentum behind it as well so I'm kind of excited to be a part of this conversation and and really keen to see how we can bring all those different kind of voices into the kind of narrative um also you know, how do we you know how do we demonstrate the real value of of what we're talking about here to some of those the, the kind of bean cans perhaps that we're, we're perhaps facing and 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 up against um yeah, I'm, I'm very curious. Uh, I think there's a lot, a lot going on, which is also really exciting because sometimes you get kind of a little bit, oh, you know, what's happening in the world and it's all a bit doom and gloom. But then you kind of come to things like this and it's all very exciting. There's lots of happiness going on and, and some really positive people working hard. So I am really excited by that. And I'm just really keen. And I work with Daphne, I work with Leah, and I work with Eddie and other people here on the, on the link today and Stuart and others. So I'm sure I will be able to kind of get involved in how we can have a wider conversation. And we've had some really, really positive work with Princess Hay and in Exeter and with John Lewis and Mark Spencer in our in our role with Exeter Partnership and Prolab. So hopefully perhaps we can utilize some of those relationships as well. So I offer that. That's my offer to this kind of organization and this group of people to say, let's make some use of those relationships as well. Great, thank you very much, Fiona. Uh, Olivia, before you go, um, you, you're going to, you've agreed to do a little breakout room. Um, did you want to say what you're going to talk about? Yes, there was a couple of slides that I had to go through real quick. So there's a, there's a slide that's about get started. It's about identifying the challenges and the barriers that we have in the city center. And that's something I wanted to address. And then the second question would be, what can artists do? And that would be about 20, you know, 20 minute conversations. What are the challenges and how would we respond to them? Um, and when I say artist, I mean everybody. I don't mean just people who have art education. I think arts, um, artistic thinking is about asking deeper questions, questions that are beyond financial, economic, 
uh, returns of investment. They're more about social and um, moral uh, values. <laughs> so brilliant. Yeah. Thank you so much, Holly. Yeah, that's great. So hopefully people will hopefully join you in your in your uh, book out later on. So that's lovely. And uh, thirdly, uh, moving on, we have uh, Jojo Spinks from Interwoven Productions. Uh, good evening, Jojo. Welcome. Yes, yes, thanks very much. Um, yeah, so we are Interwoven Production CIC. Um, Daphne, if I, uh, you're in charge of my slides, you can put the in intro one up if, um, if you like, you can share that. So we are creative placemakers. Uh, that means we, um, uh, we help communities all over the city, in fact, not just in the city centre. We help communities find creative ways to celebrate their place. Um, uh, we do this through the squillimeter technique, uh, which employs a circular economy, which means that the squillimeter stays in a kind of community perpetual motion that need never end. So I'm not going to talk about the squillimeter technique or interwoven too much in my talk. So if people would like to know more about community animation, creative placemaking, um, or circular economy or any of those things combined, then please do come and join me in, um, in the breakout room where we'll talk about those things. Um, so I will go on, shall I? To go to, because what I'm going to do is provoke you, I think. Here we go. So I'm launching into my five minutes, Nick, Nick who can do the stopwatch okay, yep. now. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm here this evening to, to, to provoke you, to, to ask you to think about, um, the, the, we, we've talked about engagement, we've talked about bringing community with us for these, for these street initiatives. Um, and I, and I'm, it's something that's been exercising interwoven for, uh, since we began in early 2015 for six years now, and we feel that we've done some things wrong. Um, we feel that we've learned from that and we feel that we've got some things that we can maybe share about bringing citizens with you. Because the thing is, when you go out on the street, when you move into public spaces, shared spaces, they're not just space, they are place. And the difference between the two is that places uh, implies a human relationship. So... Um, every single Exeter citizen could potentially have a slightly different relationship to that place and to you as an activist. Um, so that's some of the things that we've been we've been looking at. And I've got I've got five provocations for you, things to think about um, to bring people with you to reach beyond the converted to the people beyond so that actually, you know, you're not just speaking to the people you've already persuaded. Um, because the thing is, our citizens, the citizens of our city, uh, represent all kinds of people. And, uh, and that's a challenge when you're placemaking. That is a challenge. OK, number one, number one. Um, we have found it incredibly useful to shift from thinking about engagement to community animation. So engagement um, implies that you're bringing people towards you, towards a common understanding of what a problem might be and what a solution might be. So you're trying to engage people in that. Um, community animation, being becoming an animateur, rather means we, we, we train our place champions to stand shoulder to shoulder with their communities and, and to animate their vision. So it means going in without an agenda, and that's a biggie. So that's why I put it there as provocation number one. Uh, provocation number two, when you do this place-based kind of work, um, actually segmenting communities into social and economic groups is not useful. And that, that is difficult for um, creatives and for other community activists because that's where the funding comes from. It's normally segmented. You normally have to siphon off particular groups in order to prove benefit. Uh, it's a very difficult way to start a conversation in a place-based context because every context is multivocal. Every place will be made up of all sorts of different types of people. 
Um, if you start messing about with them artificially, they can tell, they don't like it. The other thing that's really difficult way to start a conversation is by saying, this is what we've got to achieve. The funding says this, we've got to achieve this. What do you think? Well, the chances are you won't even get them in the door, let alone stay with you. Um, there are ways to organize yourself so that you can sit at a table with a, with a street pod, we call them pods, just basically a steering group, uh, where, you, where you're not dictating the outcomes from the beginning. So if you want to talk about how, come join me later. And the other thing is commit, remove the end dates. There's nothing more painful as a community activist than to say, that's it, funding's run out, we're gone, it's over, we're out of here. It's, 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 it's a harsh, harsh way to be. Um, create a sustainable framework. That's what interwoven is, that's what the squillimeters are. So individuals may come and go, projects will flourish and subside and new projects will come, but the framework sustains. We commit and we build trust relationships in, in, one more minute. in the communities. Uh, Jojo. Okay, that's great, because I'm on to my last one. This is my biggie. Um, this, is the, this, is really, this is really naughty. Are we sure we're not part of the problem? Everyone here, and I'm guessing you can, you can disagree, we, we, we share an education, most of us are educated. We share a passion for community activism of one kind or another. Um, we, I think, I'm guessing we're pretty liberal-minded, um, uh, envir environmentally sensitive folk. Um, no, have you ever been called, what, what's the term, a snowflake? The fact is, in the last 10 years particularly, there's been a social backlash to us. You know, it's us, it's the taking against us. Have you, have you been called that term? We see it in our social networking, we saw it in the vote for Trump, we saw it in Brexit. It's, and when you step out on the streets, into shared spaces, the chances are you will encounter it there. Olya and I talked about two examples where we, where we did encounter something similar to that. Are we sure that we're not setting up such an impenetrable barrier that we're so sure we're right that we're not letting other people share their worldview because it's when we're not listening that those frustrations and antagonism come. So um, my recommendation would be to instill a reflection and action routine ask yourself in your consult consultation group your steering group is it reflective of all sorts of people or are you only talking to like-minded folk Brilliant. if you've got antagonism that's absolute yeah. gold grab it reflect on it because that's teaching you what you need to do Jojo, thank you so much that was brilliant i'm, I'm <laughs> hoping you've uh, you provoked the audience into <laughs> into Zoom comments. So be as long as they haven't left. <laughs> no, no, they're still here. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm just interested in your point about antagonism. Do you mean in the fact that antagonism, in a sense, indicates uh, the fact that there there is a connection, that even if it's, they're at, they're working with you, even they're trying to tell you tell you something. They are trying to tell you something, are trying to tell you something. And the other thing is, is if you've antagonised someone, it means you're not speaking to like-minded folk. You've found, you've, you know, you've, expand, you've at least expanded your voice outside of the social range. Um, and, and yeah, they, we may well have antagonised them. And, and that, as long as you can stop and reflect on that and come back with it and find a language that will work, that person, when they come back on board, is going to be your biggest convert. So it is, it is absolute gold. It's really, really important not only to speak to ourselves. Sure. And, and I know we're not, you're not going to talk about the squillimeter right now because you've got that's, that's your breakout room discussion. But um, is, presumably that's something you, you've used and prepared, created to help with that whole process, is it? I mean, is that, yeah. that is a kind of step-by-step -step process to help that? It is, yeah, yeah, and um, and and we're now we've we've developed, been able to develop that into a training package. We train our fantastic place champions to go and do this in their own community. And I've just spotted Jules, who's our St Thomas place champion, <laughs> um, and 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 yes, so so and it's it's 
on the street, hard won learned lessons. Does anyone have any questions or comments? Uh, uh, yes, Samuel. Hi, Jojo. That was um, that's really good. And just on your sorry, can you hear me? Just checking that. I'm yeah. Not, yeah, you're all good. Um, <laughs> just your comment on sort of Brexit and Trump and how how that is really could be really valuable for us to engage with the community. It seems like placemaking and from what I'm hearing about the other initiatives that are occurring in the city could be a, a really great way to start perhaps building something away from that away from that possible future that that we face because I think often the those um, for example Trump or Brexit can come out of people feeling like they've lost their sense of community sense of pride in an area and by building out these different initiatives we are sort of reinstating that in a more healthy way it could be but the, my question would be how do we get them in the door how do we get yeah. them in the online door at the moment yeah it's really important I, I couldn't agree more I mean they both sound such exciting initiatives for our city centre and I'm a local mm. Exonian with huge passion for my own city and uh, and I'm incredibly grateful to Alia and to Lynn for for the you know for the vision and the drive for thinking oh, I couldn't agree more Sam but I just think it's incredibly important to take local citizens with us and one of the one of the, one, for example one of the things that I thought while Lynn was talking about um, the market is that Exeter actually has a long heritage of both a lower and a higher market um, my grandmother used to be a fish seller in Higher Market on Queen Street when it was still when that, that was so within almost living memory. Um, Queen Street, those lovely um, arcade, the uh, pillars and arcades that you see, was a was a vibrant market um, connected to our river, of course. So the lower market also so foods, good stuff, goods would come across ex bridges from the market gardens on the other side of the river. And things would come into the quay, and so that's why the lower market was uh, traditionally always in the west quarter. So the west quarter is an incredibly rundown and unloved kind of place now, but it's got this wonderful heritage of mar very successful markets. We've only recent, in recent years, lost them. There's a lot of heritage to there, and I think if you tapped into the uh, local mindset about um, about west quarter heritage. You've got the potential not just to bring the people who live there now with you, but also um, the people who were uh, moved out to our council estates. So it's um, so that there will be many people on Berkeley's Lane Council Estate, Buddle Lane Council Estate, who remember that their grandparents worked in such and such a market. They, you know, there's work there to be done, plugging into the heritage of our place and to people's memories. This is what I talk about. The difference between a space, it's not just a street to decorate with our modern sense, but it's a place with, with relationships that have been built up over generations, extra 2,000 years old. We can't trample all over that and expect people to come with us because our local Exonians probably won't be educated. No. Frankly, they probably don't, you know, they if they got their education, they left. <laughs> so, so we need to find another way to talk to our local Exonians and tap into their richness of their relationship with these our places jojo thank you so much that was very very interesting provocative and i'm um uh, you've got a breakout room which i think you're going to talk about the school of meter but i think probably any other of these subjects that, that people might bring around uh, uh community animation uh, so thank you so much um and finally we move over to uh paul welcome paul hi yeah thank How you. Are you all right so uh last but not least um so paul's gonna <clears throat> talk us about Give us a slightly bigger picture about kind of social enterprise and community building in i think it's exeter but possibly wider in devon i don't know you could you can explain that a little bit more to us yeah sure Um, so um, uh, just a quick introduction from me. So I'm Paul White. I have my own social enterprise business in Exeter that uh, is looking to bring a well uh, well-being solution to marketplace. But I'm also um, passionate about the not-for-profit sector and have joined uh, Essence and uh, I'm currently sitting as chair at Essence in helping to try to develop that uh, community and through this program that Daphne has introduced to you too. Um, so 
taking on board everything that was presented and I've, what I've been doing in the background, uh, supporting Essence, is looking at the data of what's out there, you know, um, and especially around the not-for-profit sectors. So everything from charities, voluntary community, social enterprises, cooperatives, and um, through that ha have established a massive picture of action that's going on. Um, lots and lots and lots of initiatives, um, people-driven. Um, so we've heard of some excellent ones on the talk tonight from three of our uh, uh, presenters. Um, but there's actually lots and lots of other stuff going on. Um, some of it's around um, built places, built establishments. Some of it's in the form of associations and charitable grant funded type arrangements. Some of it's actually social enterprise and looking at, you know, essentially creating more of an industry, if you like, around the change that they're delivering. Um, and as Jojo touched on, you know, there's history and heritage and celebration of place is, is, is part of the process. Um, there's the economic opportunities, as we've heard from Lynn, around marketplaces, um, building relationships and just establishing well-being hubs and places where people can go to secure support or engage with others. Um, obviously, again, some of that's been impacted by COVID. Um, there's a, there's uh, opportunities around empowering communities to take more ownership for spaces, perhaps for the management of the local park and they take on that so it's not dependent on the local authority and how much they can afford to put to planting flowers people take on that role and do it for themselves and then celebrate and use that space in, a, in, a, in an entirely new way as a, as a community um, and then the, you know through to early intervention prevention well-being development type focuses and in fact an enormous amount of the not-for-profit sector is focused around well-being development themes and when we when we look at what they're doing and you know in that model uh, one of the objectives i think that we're all looking for is self-social prescribing so self-help being empowered and being able to identify with places or with resources or with activities that are going on that enable us to address well-being concerns on our own in a positive way and with people that we you know that we know that we trust that are around us uh, and, and not distant to us are more local so there's a tremendous amount going on out there um, they take various forms societies and associations like Exeter City AFC they're very proactive in supporting community initiatives Pinho Community Association St Leonard's Neighbourhood Association examples uh, built environment places like Heavetree Social Club one for Community Learning Centre so assets that can be utilised perhaps in entirely different ways. We look at developing um, community and how we bring people to celebrate and make different uses of their spaces. Uh, specialised focus groups, you know, Living Options Devon, who work with communities and address issues around inclusion for people with disabilities. So, you know, looking at social challenges of individuals that live within our, in our neighbourhoods. And then community engagement, interwoven being a classic example of that. So creating new opportunity for connection and celebration and um, a realisation that actually where we live has a fantastic heritage. And um, Daphne, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, so um, one of the interesting things is the um, breadth and depth. So this is an analysis that's just looked at the Exeter area in the postcode districts of EX1, DX4. So um, the headlines that uh, come out of this, more than 50 organisations in total, um, ranging between charities and voluntary community type providers to social enterprises, which are more business orientated and self-sustaining, and then grant funding organisations that tend to look at uh, opportunities of supporting community development. Um, there is a distinction, I think, and something we need to know as we look at how things develop going forward. Um, the charities and voluntary community tend to be more increasingly dependent on grant funds. And as we know with COVID and with the redirection of fundings to support emergency action, we're starting to see a change in how funding is becoming available. And so we're starting to potentially see perhaps an erosion of some of the initiatives that are taking place because they're not able to gain access to the resources. So a challenge that I am working on with Essence is how do we make that more sustainable? How can we leverage the social enterprise type model to um, establish those very good things that we want to see happening and have and more of into a different model that is more self-sustaining and less dependent on charitable or voluntary um, um, uh, contribution? 
Um, but the contributions themselves are fairly significant, seven million sort of pounds around that theme of community building. Um, could be 14 million if we extend it and look at the faith group activities. I've not included those in the metrics uh, in these charts. And then overall, um, over 200 resources directly engaged in positive action. So these are innovators, entrepreneurs. These are people like Jojo, like all our speakers that we've listened to tonight that are that are out there looking at the challenges and the, and the problems and trying to come up with new and innovative ways of solving them. Um, and there are an enormous number um, in the in the data um, that I've been able to analyze. We're missing about 40 percent of the information. So in reality, the numbers in financial terms and, um, and, and, and resource terms probably increase by about another 40 percent. So it's, it's, there's a there's a good pool of resource that we could tap into potentially and extend. And then if um, we look at the next slide, um, we also have um, organizations such as Exeter City Futures is a good example, um, who are supporting projects. So again, supporting innovation and entrepreneurialism within our communities. And um, they have three uh, very excellent initiatives that have been run over the last um, 12 months and during the period of COVID, in fact, as well, that have um, uh, that they promote on their website that, that demonstrates some very positive uh, progress made despite all the difficult circumstances that we're living in where projects have taken on some challenges and actually managed to deliver some very positive outcomes and across a broad range of things. So from you know, travel to school there and, and you can see the text and the details of what that uh, was about through to reduce, reuse, recycle, um, and, and obviously addressing, you know, these addressing ecological themes in, uh, in the main, but um, there are well-being outputs that these generate, um, produced from these initiatives, um, and then through to the greening of the city and the, um, the opportunity, again, to look at our spaces and how those spaces are being managed and how um, we are able to utilize those spaces potentially all, you know, uh, in Exeter City's uh, futures case with the object of achieving those net zero targets. How do they, how do we, how do our communities, what do they, what have they got to offer in, in that challenge of, um, of, of carbon reduction and net zero gain um, over the next sort of 10 years? And, and these are just a few projects, I think, that uh, demonstrate very well a great opportunity of bringing people together of bringing all those all that resource in a in a more connected way to delivering more positive outcomes um, so that's what we've established from the data and there um i believe just on extra city futures we've got kerry on online so if kerry wanted to come in and actually give a better synopsis on the projects than i than i've done that would be quite good Hey Paul, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I, I'm just, I'm, I just kind of add that the Exit Futures is, and the work that I do in trying to um, learn. I'm learning from all of you, Jojo. You've just given an amazing kind of uh, learning, uh, sharing of great information, sharing a great, great approaches to working with communities. And I'm learning all the time, and thinking around uh, the provocations that you've set and the ways in which we are working within Exeter City Futures and how we can improve in the work that we're doing and the ways in that we, we would like to support to uh, bring Exeter residents um, with us along the journey around the net zero um, challenges and the ambition for the city. Um, and for me, the Connect events, which is which is one part of the work that I do for Exeter City Futures is, is around supporting com communities to showcase the work that they're doing. It's just a platform that enables communities to share the work amongst each other to help develop a, a vibrant uh, a community led community initiative ecosystem where people can network with each other, share expertise, um, learn from each other and hopefully develop new projects. So the grassroots grassroots based projects as well as showcasing different um, uh, employee volunteer led projects and also some council led projects as well. So we're trying to create a, a mesh of a network where conversations can happen grassroots and at different levels as well. So I just want to say thank you for Paul for, for sharing that information. Thank you, thank you, Paul, and thank you, Kerry, for uh, kind of summarising it. I'm kind of conscious of time now, um, Daphne, and I just, yes. uh, I think maybe right. we might need to kind of move on to, we, 
handing it back to you. That's great. I'll just quickly wrap up because uh, yeah. some people might not want to stay for the networking um, and to, to dive deeper into some of the things. Um, I will post um, so in, now in the chat some ways of, of keeping in touch because we really want to facilitate that more joined up um, action. Um, so you will find a link to the groups of the Regenerate Devon Summit that will link you into conversations of other enthusiasts like yourself, um, more on a Devon wide level. Um, uh, but that means that you can hook up um, uh, with like-minded people there. Um, get in touch with Nick if you want to know more about Demo Nights. Demo Nights are a series run uh, for the Southwest into innovators and entrepreneurs. Um, join Essence if you feel like you want to be a, uh, among social entrepreneurs in Exeter. And also Colab and ECI have often uh, volunteering opportunities and a particular shout out to their uh, mental health survey that they have in there because it's a very interesting initiative where they're reimagining what the community could um, offer in terms of a better mental health offering for the city. So um, I would like to thank you all for showing up here tonight and um, also on behalf of Nick. Um, please stay for some structured and unstructured networking um, to get to know more, more like-minded people um, if you'd like to wave off, feel free to leave this meeting and we will look forward to seeing you next month in which we will explore another angle of mobilizing Exeter's community enterprising spirit. It will take on the 3rd of Feb and details will follow soon. So many thanks and have a great evening. And uh, for those of you who are staying, we'll see you shortly. We'll just keep um, uh, shifting your chair and maybe take a cup of tea or something. <laughs>